time we run away, but horses know we're leaking all the time. When looking in the foot, when Gavin does the bidding bridge, the sergeant all for fun and for the prize. Because sergeant all's are with us all the time. Today we want to have a look at a symmetric encryption scheme, and in particular the most popular block cipher, that's the AES, which is short for the Advanced Encryption Standard. So it was uh, designed in the late 90s by Reimann and Dahmen, and it's been standardized and used everywhere, in all your encrypted websites, everywhere. So what does it do? It actually processes message blocks of only 128 bits and can encrypt them uh, with a secret key that has one of three bit lengths, 128, 192 or 256 bits. Most often is AS128, so we'll focus on that one. Blocks and keys have a particular bit size, so they are bit strings, but the AS actually represents them in a very specific way uh, during its operations. It writes them in the form of a 4x4 four four matrix of bytes. So we'll see this, uh, this picture here on all of the next slides. Each of the cells in this matrix is one byte, 8 bits. And both the message and the key are written in this shape. And what the AES now does with this, with this so-called state is it applies a couple of encryption rounds. Each round repeats the same operations. Uh, so let's have a look at them one by one. We have a total of four operations in each round, and the first one of them is called subbytes, which is short for byte substitution. So what does it do? Exactly what the name suggests. It takes each byte in this 4x4 four four state and replaces it according to some lookup table. And each byte is replaced according to this lookup table. After that, we are going to have two functions which are responsible for diffusion. The first one of them is the shift rows functions. So it takes this matrix, every row of this matrix, and shifts it by a particular offset. So you can see the pattern here. In the end, bytes that were in the same column before will be in different columns afterwards. Why is that relevant? That's because of the next operation, the so-called mix columns operations. So this is responsible for mixing stuff within one of these matrix columns. And it does that by interpreting the column as a column vector and multiplying it with a 4x4 four four matrix, which is specified here. And the last and very important operation is the add round operation. So what it does is it takes the round key, which is derived from the real key, and XORs it to the state. So in order to make this whole operation dependent on the secret key. And these four operations are now iterated a total of 10 times in the case of AS128. So let's have a look at that. I have prepared a picture where we see this. So we start with this in this encryption scheme by writing the message into this 4x4 four four matrix, as we've seen. We also, as a very first step right after that, XOR the key for the first time. And then we repeat these other four operations that we've seen. First the subbytes, then the shift rows, then the mixed columns. And then we do that again and again and so on, a total of 10 times. Except that the last round is a tiny bit different. You can see it in the last um, row here. It actually leaves out this mixed columns operation. But there is an additional key addition in the end. And the result after these 10 computation rounds is the so-called ciphertext block. It's exactly the same size as the message block and is our final encrypted result. So you might be wondering, how do we actually implement this? One of the ways how it's very often implemented is by using a so-called ASNI instruction set. And it has one CPU instruction which does an entire round of AES. It's called AES-ENC. There's also a special function for the modified last round and extra functions for the decryption rounds and so on. So that's really nice and simple to use. Yeah. But what if, what if my processor doesn't have that? Well, that's a good question because unfortunately there are some around who don't. In that case, you need a different kind of implementation which has its own downside, so it's not used very often. One way to still implement the whole function in one go is a so-called t-table implementation, which implements the entire round using only table lookups. No matrix multiplication, nothing. It does all of that with just one table lookup. The downside is that um, this is rather susceptible to certain kinds of sidechain attacks. So how does it work? So it looks a bit similar to the subbyte step in itself. So it takes each byte of this value before subbytes, but instead of just doing the subbytes with the table lookup, you actually have huge tables that compute you the entire round. 
So you have four different tables, one for each row of the state, and that's it. So with a total of 16 table lookups, you can do your entire AES round. For the last round, you can also use these lookup tables to get your result. Okay, so that's everything from my side on the AES. Thanks everybody for joining and see you all next week. Operating system Stalin is in two hours. Maybe you should already send it now. Great job. You saved me my paper. Welcome. Jonas, Lukas, what happened to your submission? Was it a zip bomb attempt? Uh, zip bomb? Yeah, that's a zip file where you put in a file into it that describes itself as really large. Thank you, I, I know what a zip bomb is. Well, I thought it's an interesting concept and we should mention interesting things like look left and right while you explain things. It fits into the story here also. No, we didn't try to zip bomb your test system. I was there as a witness. You have to believe us. We submitted a normal file. Can we just send you the file now? No, you always have something. You need some gray spirit or something else. You have to learn to meet a deadline. So no, no further extensions for you. <sighs> Come on. So maybe there's a bug yes. in the uploading function and it didn't store the file properly and now it has zero bytes. That would be so unfair. Did you know that the files are stored um, on our FLATS server? Really? They are, yeah. Some years ago they were even unencrypted and uh, I could check out the files although I was not the tutor for the lecture. <laughs> that was a big problem. Unencrypted student files? Yes, of course. But now uh, Claudio changed that and he introduced AES encryption. Mm -hmm. But let me check. Um, so I have this, uh, let me check the stu student submissions. It's here. Look at this. I still have read and write permission to these files. I can probably also check out your submission. Yeah. What was your group number? 243. Two, four, two, four, oh yeah, it's the empty file. Look yes. At that. So maybe we can try to resolve that situation, but how? So, he's using AES, right? Yeah. Maybe we can find a side channel in his AES implementation. In AES? And break it. That algorithm is used everywhere. Oh, if yes. If that works, if that works, we will be really, really famous. We have to try that. Yes. You're fantasizing about becoming famous again? We had an idea, we could break AES with a side channel. Wait, the professor told me, told us, there's an insecure implementation, give me a second. Mm -hmm. Right, look at this, the open SSL T-table implementation. Take a look. Oh, that looks very complicated. And would that implementation be used in practice? No, it's not. So I actually had to compile OpenSSL with extra flags and modifications to make it use t-tables. Well, actually there are all some uh, libraries that still use uh, t-tables, for example, Bouncy Castle in, in Java. Mm. It's really. Yeah, so I think it is a relevant attack that the students should learn about. Right, so this is what AES looks like, right? Okay. So you have these t-tables. And they have a total of 160 accesses to them. Mm -hmm. For each, for all 16 bytes, each round you have one access, right? Mm -hmm. Now imagine... And it's like 10 rounds here. Yeah, it's 10 rounds, 16 accesses per round for 16 okay, bytes. Okay, okay. And now imagine if you knew every location of each of these accesses. Ah, because that's key dependent where the lookup is, then you know the key. Then you know the key, right? And then you broke AS. Yeah. And that works with, because it's a table lookup and it goes into the cache, it works with flush and reload and the attack works. In theory. But in practice it looks like it's really fast. So right now what I'm doing is looping over one of these entries. It looks like AES is just faster than my reload loop. Okay. You know, I gotta leave for a lecture, mm -hmm. so why don't you figure it out?
For Lucas tried to observe every single access. Now I'm just looking uh, which parts of the t-table are in the cache after the encryption. And if I run this, so I have now implemented this for, um, take a look at this. Mm -hmm. So for a fixed um, key, I just took some random data as a key and uh, a fixed plain text. And if I run this, Look at this, always the same two cache lines don't get a cache hit. Oh, yeah. The others always mm -hmm. have a cache hit. That's interesting. So this information must already leak something about the, the, the key. Mm -hmm. What happens if you use random plain texts? Uh, let me try. So you mean like here, I initialize the plain text to zero and you say I should say rend modulo 256 or something. Yeah. Now it's initialized with random data. Let's try that. Okay, we, we run this make, okay, and compile this. Uh-huh. Oh yes, look at this. It's, it changes with the, with the plain text. Yeah. Okay, okay. So it also must change for different keys because you XOR them together. Yeah. So now we could try to iterate the first byte of the plain text from 0 to 255. To check whether there's some structure behind that? Maybe, maybe there is. Let me try that. Okay, take a look at this. So I now only added that I iterate over the um, first byte mm -hmm. and I will also show that and now we have a matrix here of course because this is like the the all the values and I only print every 16th value because what happens if I try this with every value I will show you that as well so I think so you can you can barely see that and it doesn't fit on my terminal but you can see that always 16 values uh, have a cache hit and I think I know why these entries in the t table they are four bytes and a cache line has 64 bytes so always 16 of these values go into one cache line yeah this one yeah because it's really interesting what you can see here mm -hmm. for every key byte there is one byte, one input plain text byte, where the cache hit rate is really high and low mm -hmm. for all the others. About 92%. Yeah, so there is definitely a connection there between the plain text and the key and, and the cache, cache hits. So if you know the cache hits and the plain text, we get the key. So this attack is what we call a first round attack. So you have this formula here for the table access, you have plain text uh, byte uh, zero and key byte zero, they go into one table entry here. And then if you know the table entry that was accessed, then you can recover the key because you know the plain text. But? So there's the problem, uh, the cache line uh, actually has 64 bytes and a t-table entry only has four bytes. That means that 16 entries of a t-table go into the same location, and that means I only have 16 candidates for each possible key byte, and that leaves me with 64 bits that I still need to recover. Yeah, so um, we should explain a different attack. I think we need a better attack. Mm. What happens if we turn this around? You mean attacking the last t-table lookup? Yeah, exactly. Do you have these slides from the crypto lecture? You mean this one? Mm -hmm. So this is the last t-table lookup where these intermediate values are used. Yeah, and we recover the 16 candidates for each of the intermediate inputs here. But if you want to compute this through, how would that work? The key is used here and we don't know the key. But we know the ciphertext and we have 16 candidates for the intermediate value. So we use the same trick as before. We have this XOR and we can turn it around. So we can compute through here with these 16 values and if the ciphertext fits, we know the key. Oh, that's exactly the same as before. But this time, this will be a bit different because of these operations here, 
the excesses here to this tea table will be all scattered. So we don't have these nice 16 uh, element blocks anymore that we can group together by plain text or by key byte. But we now have to group them together by cipher text, but it will be all scattered over the tea table. Mm -hmm. If you run this with many cipher texts, then you will have the same key candidates often, but only the correct key candidate will have a cache hit in all the runs for all the cipher texts. Wow, and that's a difference to the attack in the first round. Exactly, because there they were grouped together and you would always learn the same thing with new plain texts. But this time, because of this uh, other steps that we go through, we still get different cache hits. Amazing, amazing. I see a drink's empty. Oh yeah. Should I bring you another one? Oh yeah, sure, if you're... Yeah, thank you. So I talked to Lucas about our idea and it almost works, but with our approach, we only get the last round key. And to recover the full key, we only have to yeah. reverse run the last round key through this key schedule. Exactly, yeah, I already implemented okay. that. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot of ugly code, of course, but you can just copy that in from some AES implementation. Um, so I also added this nice visualization where we can see exactly um, which uh, cache line, um, which, which cache lines or key candidates um, we have illustrated. This is just for the first key byte, right? But we could do this for all the key bytes. And you can now see which have the most uh, cache hits, which of the candidates. And if I, so you can see that down here, the recovered key is this. And I also have this cut here where I grab for the key. Is it right? It looks good. I think it works. Damn. We recovered the full key. Wow. We completely broke AES. We will be famous. Well, now we just need to try it on Cloud is Encrypted. Oh, yes, of course. Let me do that. Jonas, can you try now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Look at this. Now the test system tells us that all our tests succeeded. Nice. Nice. Okay. Justice served. <laughs> <laughs> They then succeed with all the test cases and then Claudio notices this, that they have a modification after the deadline and tells him... And no more bug hunting on my live system without telling me what you do exactly beforehand. Of, of course, Claudio. But what is more important, we broke AES. So this is like the most secure crypto algorithm out there. And we broke it. We will be famous. Yeah, let's talk to our crypto prof. Oh, this is, this is huge. Yes. Yes, we will go to you. We broke it, yes. Uh, no. But... With flash and reload, we use a flash and reload attack and recover the full AES key. Uh, so first, you didn't break AES, and second, that's not actually new. So if you have a look here, um, I can show you a paper which does exactly what you are doing. And since this has been known for some time, we also know how to defend against that. So if you implement the AES, you should usually choose an implementation that is side channel resistant. So for example, you could do something like ASNI or a bit sliced implementation. What is that? So ASNI is essentially an implementation directly in hardware where you can uh, execute the entire round in one go without caches or anything. Um, in a bit sliced implementation, you translate the AS round function into a long sequence of individual arithmetic and logical operations. No cache accesses at all. So that means that we cannot use any secret dependent code, no secret dependent branches, no secret dependent memory accesses. That's exactly the goal of what we try to achieve in secure implementations. So we call this constant time. And this is how we usually try to implement crypto. Thank you. OK, thanks. Bye. <sighs> So maybe 
maybe we don't get famous by breaking cryptography, but... Uh, I'm pretty sure there were way more ways processors leak data. Yeah. And we will find more. Let's take a closer look at them. Yeah. Hmm, maybe I should recommend to them to join the student lab.